Hi, welcome to class. My name is Don LaFon, Professor Don, and this week in Cisco One, we are covering Module 15, the application layer. Now, most of you are fam familiar with the applications that we use on a computer. So the application protocols that we discuss in this module aren't that difficult to understand, and you should be fine with this process. Shouldn't be too difficult. Let me go ahead and share my screen. If you have any questions and you're watching this with me live, please ask your questions at the end of the presentation. And if you're watching it as a recording inside of Netacad, please ask your questions inside of the help discussion forums and, and your fellow students and I will help you. If you're watching this on YouTube and you have a question, please ask your question uh, in the comment section below the video and um, and help each other. Don't just wait for me to come by and answer those questions, uh, but please uh, ask your questions and I will try to do my best to be timely in responding to your questions. Now, this is module 15, the application layer. In this module, we, I am going to explain the operation of the application layer protocols in providing support to end user applications. I'll explain how the functions of the application layer presentation layer and session layer work together to provide network services to end user applications. I'll explain how end user applications operate in a peer-to-peer -peer network. I'll explain how web and email protocols operate, how DNS and DHCP operate, and how, how file transfer protocols operate, FTP and FTP, and trivial file transfer protocol, TFTP. First, we'll start with application and present presentation and session. Now, the upper three layers of the OSI model, application, presentation, and session, define functions of the TCP application layer. So these three layers are equal to the TCP application layer. Uh, app TCP model came out first. The OSI model just decided that they needed a little bit more uh, functional definition of what goes on. And so they split it into three different, uh, um, uh, three different um, uh, layers, I'm sorry, three different layers. The application layer provides the interface between the applications used to communicate and the underlying network over which the messages are actually transmitted. Some of the most widely known application layer protocols include HTTP, FTP, TFTP, IMAP, and DNS. Uh, we also include uh, in this uh, layer uh, domain name system, DNS, hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, and HTTPS, simple mail protocol, simple mail transfer protocol, SMTP, post office protocol, POP, dynamic host. Configuration pro protocol, DHCP, file transfer protocol, and internet message access protocol, IMAP, IMAP. Now, uh, we cover all of those. So uh, the presentation is relatively simple because most of you will know all of those applications, what they do, how they do it, and what they do. Uh, so this presentation, there's a lot of applications we talk about, but you should be familiar with most of them. The presentation layer has three primary functions. It formats or presents data at the source device into a compatible format for receipt by the destination device. Compression data, it compresses data in a way that can be decompressed by the destination device and it encrypts data for transmission and decrypts data upon receipt. So this is not, the presentation layer is super easy. Just think it presents the data. And how does it present the data? What are all of the, the uh, formats that you can present data in? You can have MOV, QuickTime Movies. You can have uh, MP3 video. You can have MKV uh, video. You can have GIF and JPEG and TIFF. Uh, all of those, PNG, PNG, all of those are at, uh, at the presentation layer and it presents the data. That's how I remember it. Now, the session layer uh, creates and maintains dialogue between the source and destination applications. It handles the exchange of information to initiate dialogues, keeps them active, 
and restart sessions that are disruptive or disrupted or idle for a long period of time. That's what happens at the session layer. Now, the TCP application protocols um, specify the format and control information necessary for many common internet communication functions. Application layer protocols are used by both the source and destination devices during a communication session. For the communication to be successful, the app application layer protocols that are implemented on the source and the destination must be compatible. So if we are using DNS on TCP uh, UDP, um, TCP UDP client um, uh, 5053 DNS server, it has to be the same. It, it has to transmit both the source and the destination has to be the same. Uh, DHCP has to be the same. UDP client 68, server 67. Uh, HTTP has to be the same. TCP 80 or 8088. Uh, we know what those do, so I'm not going to go into the details on each one, uh, but they have to, They both the source and the, de the the destination both have to understand HTTP and DNA, all of the protocols the same way on the same ports. Peer to peer. Client server model, uh, client server processes are considered to be in the application layer. In the client server model, the de destination requesting the information is called the client, the device responding is called the server. Application layer protocols describe the format of the requests and responses between the clients and server. We, we can On this slide, you can see it a little bit better. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer network, two or more computers are connected via a network. They can share resources such as printer and files uh, without having a dedicated server. Every connected end device is known as, known as a peer, can function as both the client and the server. Uh, one computer might assume the role of a client for one transaction and then turn around and be the server for the other. The roles of the client and server are set on a per request basis. So in this case, we have uh, an example of the, uh, in this case, the, the peer one, the printer uh, requests uh, a file to be print, printed. So this is a the client, it sends to the server, peer two, who serves the printer. Uh, and it uh, then send that data, it sends that data back to peer one. So in this case, peer one is the client, peer two is the server. Now, on the other hand, if they were transmitting files, peer two can be requesting a file from peer one. Peer two would be the client, peer one would be the server. They switch. You guys should know about peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks at, at this point. Client server uh, is always the, um is always uh the same so we have a server i should say and that server could be serving uh i went backwards though to just to clarify that server remains the server and the server will serve web pages it will serve uh maybe as the um authentication server uh it will serve uh the file server uh, there's 15 different servers, right? It's always the server in a client server model. Uh, your devices are always the uh, clients uh, compared to peer to peer uh, networks where it can change. Now, there's also uh, peer to peer applications such as um, where the device uh, acts as both the client and the server within the same communication. And you can see that uh, in something like uh, a text message, for example, you are both you are going back and forth. You're the client and the server uh, to send and receive text messages. Now, uh, common peer to peer applications uh, include BitTorrent, Direct Connect, eDonkey, Freenet. That's where uh, each computer in the network that is running the application can act as the client or the server. So uh, one device uh, handles the connections, but the actual data is coming from the peer networks. So these, this, serve, this um, device has a song, and these devices all, uh, all download that song. Now they all have the song. Now they can be clients then and uh, share that song with other people. Of course, always legally.
web and email protocols. So hypertext transfer protocol and hypertext markup language uh, or are um, uh, are uh, in this, our TCP, uh, when a web address or uniform resource locator URL is typed into a web browser, the web browser establishes a connection to the web server. The web server is running on the server on the server that is using HTTP protocol. They have to match, remember? To better understand how the web server and the browser interact, example, examine how a web page is opened in the browser. So somebody, you, types uh, the URL uh, HTTP www.cisco.com. Now that is sent uh, from the client to the server. On the other end, uh, the server receives that request, uh, and but it does actually it doesn't directly receive it because it needs to be converted to a number to be able to receive that client. Uh, assume. In this case, it assumes, um, no, well, I'm jumping ahead, I apologize. So the browser checks the name to see uh, to see if it has it in its database of recently connected devices. I'll come back to that in a little bit. If it does, then it just responds, uh, which it, it doesn't need to reach out to a DNS server. The client initiates the HTTP request uh, to a server and sends the GET request to the server asking for the index.html file. In response to the request, the server sends the HTML code from the website back to the browser, uh, and the browser then de deciphers the HTML code. Now, in my head, I was thinking ahead, I am going to talk to you about how uh, the different layers of the web page uh, are connected. Uh, but for now, if you understand the three different pieces. Uh, the file is index.html. The bra the uh, product the server name is www.cisco.com, and the protocol is HTTP. Of course, you understand that because all of you have made it through the A plus classes. You you'll be fine. Now, uh, and then the uh, the GET request uh, returns uh, the uh, information back to the server. Now the GET which is shown here as a GET request, um, uh, is a client request for data. A client, the web browser, sends the GET request to the web server to request HTML pages. Now, the, it, uh, the client could also send a POST or a PUT. A POST, it, it's actually uploading data to a form, for example, uh, and a PUT, uh, it uploads resources or content to the web server, such as an image. So maybe you're modifying uh, the your own website that would be an example of a put putting your own data out on the website. Now, um, HTTP is a request response protocol that specifies the message type used for that communication. And I just explained the three the three pieces. Uh, HTTP is not a secure protocol, so you should always use HTTPS so somebody can't uh, read your data in transmission. Now, email protocols. Uh, email is a store and forward method of sending, storing, and retrieving electronic messages across the network. Email messages are stored in a database on a mail server. The, the email clients communicate with mail servers to send and receive email. The email protocols used are simple mail text transfer protocol, SMTP, that's used to send. And then to receive, it's either post office protocol or IMAP. Uh, which we will uh, see in just a moment. And they are just showing sending a message and it's sent through SMTP and then it's downloaded either by IMAP or POP when the destination of the recipient reaches out to get that information. SMTP, POP, and IMAP. When a client sends email, the client SMTP process connects with the server on the well known port 25. After the connection is made, the client attempts to send the mail to the server across the connection. When the server receives the message, it either places the message in a local account, if the recipient is local, or forwards the message to another mail server for delivery, which is the majority of the case in, in, unless you're sending email to another um, person that works at your company and that person would be on its own server. It doesn't need to go out to the 
the internet to send that. It just goes to the, the server can handle that. Now, the destination email service may not be online or it may be busy. If so, SMTP spools messages to be sent at a later time. I remember back when I was in the Navy, uh, we used to be able to send messages, uh, but the internet connection wasn't always connected. So when we were not connected, it would just go to the go to the um, the serve the server the email server, and it would just store those until a connection was made, and then it would batch transmit. And then the same thing with you can think of it logically when you think of a ship underway, not always connected. How would it get that data uh, to be able to understand this concept? Uh, in reality, you could just uh, be talking on your laptop, talking about a laptop not on, right? Somebody sends you an email when you open the laptop and you check for email, that is when the data is actually sent. Now, what? how do you read email? Well, there's two, POP and IMAP. So POP is used by the application to receive mail from the mail server. When the mail is downloaded from the server to the client using POP, the messages are then deleted on the server. I like to think of them as popping, right? Once you read it, it's gone, right? Like a balloon pops, it's gone, right? That's how I remember the difference. The server starts the POP, uh, the post office protocol service, uh, by passively listening on TCP port 110 for the client connection request. When a client wants to make use of the service, it sends a request to establish a TCP connection with the server. When the connection is established, the POP server sends a greeting. The client and the POP server then exchange the commands and responses until the connection is closed after the mail is transferred. Since POP does not store the messages, it is not recommended for small businesses that need a centralized backup solution. Now, don't believe that this data is not stored someplace out on the internet, uh, even though it's removed from what you can see on the server, Trust me, the FBI can see that data even if you use uh, POP because it's stored coming in the other direction. You just can't see it when you go out there. Now, IMAP is another program that describes the method for retrieving email messages. Unlike POP, when a user connects to an IMAP server, copies, the message, copies of the messages are downloaded to the client application. The original messages are kept on the server until manually deleted. When a user deletes, decides to delete a message, the server then synchronizes that action and deletes the message from the server. Now, I like to think of this as my Gmail account. When I read my mail on my phone, it, unless I hit delete on my phone, when I open up my computer and I go to Gmail, all those messages are there. They're just no longer bold because I've already read them. They're not deleted. Gmail is probably a bad example because even when you delete an email on Gmail, it still saves the email uh, until you delete it from the deleted uh, files and then it's really gone. Not really gone, just gone from your computer. It's still out on the server someplace as a backup so the FBI can catch you doing bad things or whatever country you're in, uh, your country can catch you doing bad things. All right. So uh, that is IMAP. And again, uh, to uh, think about it as mapping the data, right? Once it's mapped, it's there. They mapped America, and now America has a map. It doesn't go away unless you burn the map. I don't know. But I remember pop, the pop because easy to pop. Uh, a balloon goes away. Not really, but you can't. It's not big anymore, right? And then IMAP, um, uh, you map it. It's there until you delete it off the server. IP addressing services. So the domain name service we've talked about before, but the domain, domain names were created to convert numeric, numeric IP addresses into simple recognizable names. So uh, it turns the words www.cisco.com uh, into the numbers uh, which is the actual address where the server has the file that you're looking for. The full, a fully qualified domain name, FQDNs, uh, such as HTTP w, colon slash slash forward slash forward slash www.cisco.com 
is so much easier to remember than 198, 133, 219, 25. So uh, be thankful for DNS. The, the domain name service DNS protocol defines an automatic service that matches the resource names with the required numerical network numeric network addresses. It includes a format um, for queries, responses, and data. So in this case, they're just showing you uh, that the DNS server, um, here's a client, I'm sorry, coming on this side, you type uh, www.cisco.com. Uh, it, uh, it goes out to the, the DNS server. The DNS server responds uh, with the um, true numerical address of the server. Uh, go then it, then that that information is then sent to uh, the client sends it to that numerical address. You don't see that change. All you see is the Cisco.com and the URL header. You don't see the actual IP address unless you do something uh, like a, a ping. I'm sorry, a trace route or trace sort uh, where you actually uh, look to see all of the destination pings all the way along. And note, remember it. Those are all responded to in a numerical form. So that gives you an idea about um, how that works. Okay. And then uh, the message format, the DNS server stores different types of resource records that are used to resolve names. These records contain the name address and type of record. Some of these record types include A for an end device IPv4 address. Uh, NS is an author authoritative name server. Uh, triple uh, quad A is an end device IPv6 address. MX is a mail exchange record. Now, when a client makes a query, the server, DNS server process, first looks at its own records to resolve the name. I mentioned that earlier. I said it looks local to see if it already has the information. If you go to the same website on a regular basis, like how often I go to to, um, uh, to netacad.com, it may already, it probably is already, probably burned to into uh, my RAM at this point. But anyways, it's, it's in the DNS um, uh, list and it's able to resolve the name without having to reach out to uh, the top level domain to get that address. Now, after a match is found and returned to the original requesting server, the server temporarily stores the numbered address, that new numbered address, in the event that that same name is requested again. Uh, and that is why when you go to a website a second time, uh, it's always faster than the first time. Now, this was completely evident when I first started computing uh, back in the 80s. When you went to a website the first time, it took a long time for all of that information to be sent to your computer. In today's world of gigabit connections to the internet, that time you really can't see, but it does save time not having to go out to uh, the, uh, the top level domains to request the address again. It just, it just gets it from its own um, DNS database of names using these the records, it's using these record types, these record types uh, to pull that information out. Now, uh, DNS uses the same message format between servers consisting of a question, answer authority, and additional information for all types of client queries and server responses, error messages, and transfer of resource record information. So a question is a question for the name server, an answer is a resource record answering a question, Authority is a resource resource record resource record pointing towards an authority for a website uh, to validate. Okay, we just had a little glitch. There's a storm going on outside. I'm going to blame it on the storm. Uh, and uh, my uh, video went out. So hopefully you didn't notice too much of a glitch there, uh, but it's back now. So let's keep going. 
So DNS uses a hierarchic, hierarchical system. Uh, I said it much better again, much much better a moment ago. <laughs> DNS uses a hierarchical system to create a database to provide name resolution. Each DNS server maintains a specific database file and is only responsible for managing name to IP mappings for that small portion of the entire DNS structure. When a DNS server receives a request for a name translation that is not within its DNS zone, the DNS server forwards the request to another DNS server within the proper zone for translation. Examples of top level domains include .com, .org, .au. They, they have other ones here, uh, .co. At, anyways, uh, when you make a request, it goes to, and it's not in the locally stored, as we were just talking about with the local stored records, then it goes out to the top level domain uh, to get the resolution for where that address actually is. And then that's returned to you. And I showed you the slide just a few minutes ago about that. All right, so hopefully you guys are familiar with that. Uh, the NS lookup command. Now the NS, look, NS lookup is a computer operating system utility uh, that you can run on your PC uh, that allows a user to manually query the DNS server configuration on the device to see the names that have been stored or to resolve a given host name. The utility can also be used to troubleshoot name resolution issues and to verify the current status of the name server. When the NSF NS lookup um, command is issued, the default DNS server configuration for your host is displayed. The name of a host or domain can be en then entered uh, at the NS, lo NS lookup command. First time I used this, it was really confusing. I did NS lookup and then I put the website and it didn't work the way I expected it to. Uh, and then I didn't know how to get out of it. Uh, and it's just exit. So you type NS lookup and then you wait a moment and then you type the website you want information about. You can continue typing additional websites that you're info that you want to know about and it will return uh, the servers and addresses uh, for uh, each one of your search your searches uh, and then you have to type exit to get out of that. I think you can also hit the escape key uh, don't hold me to that but I think uh, exit is the proper command now dynamic host protocol uh, DHCP uh, is uh, also something you guys should be familiar with uh, it is for IPv4 services to automatically assign IPv4 addressing addresses, subnet masks, gateways, and other IPv4 networking parameters. DHCP is considered dynamic addressing compared to static addressing. Static addressing is when you go up to a, a PC and you manually type in its IP addresses. Obviously, if you have one computer in a small business, eh, static addresses is fine. But if you've got just one classroom of 24 computers, uh, manually entering the IP address on 24 computers, it's likely you're going to make an error someplace. So what you do instead is you create a DHCP uh, server that has a pool of addresses. Uh, when the host connects to the network, the DHCP server is contacted and an address is requested. The DHCP server chooses an address from a configured range of addresses, the pool of addresses, and assigns or leases it to the host. Many networks use both DHCP and static addressing. So for example, you could use DHCP for general purpose hosts like other end device users, the computers in a lab, but you would use a static address for devices such as a printer or router or gateway, uh, the gateway address on your router, uh, default gateway address on your router that you wouldn't want to change, uh, switches, servers, and printers. Uh, printers are easy to understand. If the printer always has the same IP address, then you can reconnect every time you turn your computer on. If it doesn't have the same IP address, the 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 when it when it goes to print, it's not going to find the IP at printer as mapped uh, in your computer. You would have to remap it every single time. You would, you would be able to find it because it gets an IP address, but you would have to remap it every time you turn on your computer. Now, DHCP for IPv6 
provide similar services for IPv6 clients. However, DHCP v6 does not provide a default gateway address. Uh, this can be uh, only obtained dynamically from the router advertisement messages, the RA messages. Um, I want to add uh, that it's only DHCP v6. Normally, IPv6 uses Slack or Slack with DHCP. Uh, Slack is, remember, I think we spoke about it already, is where uh, an end device, a host that needs an IPv6 address is able to create its own IPv6 address uh, from the information that comes from that router advertisement. Uh, the DHCP process includes DORA, easy to remember for you, those of you with small children. Uh, when uh, let me show you Dora. Dora is discover, offer, request, and act. Uh, and uh, act. So discover, offer, request, and act. That's Dora. The first letter helps you to remember the order and what the commands are. Now, an IPv4 DHCP configure configured device boops boots up and connects to the internet. The client broadcasts uh, out onto the network. A DHCP discoverer asking for a DHCP server uh, if there's any out there. The DHCP server replies with a "Hey, I'm here, and here's an app, here's an offer." It actually offers a lease of an IP address to the client. If the client receives more than one due to multiple DHCP servers on the network, it must pick one. Then that's the offer. Uh, so the server responds with an offer. Then the client accepts the offer. That's the, oh, it requests, which is basically saying, yeah, I'll take yours. Uh, it requests uh, that address. Remember, there could be multiple DHCP uh, servers um, offering multiple addresses. So it picks one and it says, um, I'd like this one. And then the DHCP server says, okay, you've got that one. That's the acknowledgement that finishes the process. So discover, offer, request, and acknowledge Dora. You can't go wrong. Uh, DHCP v6 has a set of messages that are similar to those as to DHCP v4. Uh, we have router solicitation, router, router advertisement, information requests, and replies. You're going to do a lab uh, on uh, discovering uh, or observing DNS resolution, and you're going to use the NS look lookup command. Uh, file sharing services. So FTP was developed to allow for data transfer between client and server. An FTP client is an application which runs on a computer that is being used to push and pull data from FTP server. So basically, you have a place that has a, a file, or if it's um, a server, it could be also peer-to-peer -peer, uh, where it is asking for a file from another computer. That computer becomes the server for the, that period of time. The client establishes the first connection to the server for, for control traffic. Uh, and just remember, it's 21. The first thing that happens is it, it uh, makes a con uh, connection. Uh, the traffic consists of client commands and server replies, just what the commands are back and forth. Then the client establishes a second connection to the server for the actual data transfer. Uh, that's on port 20. Um, I, um, I, can't, I can't tell you how to remember 20. 21, I can remember. 20, uh, in my head, I always just think it doesn't make sense that the data is after the, no the port number is after the command. But the first thing that happens 21, uh, is the command is connected and then doesn't make sense, but 20, that's how I remember it. You might say, uh, I, I don't know, if, unless you want to do it my way, I don't know how you're going to remember 20 and 21, but that's what it is. Uh, 21 comes first, then 20 when we're dealing with FTP. The connection is created every time there's a data, there is data to be transferred. The data transfer can happen in either direction. The client can download or pull data from the server, or the client can upload or push data to the server. 
And then the final thing we mentioned, kind of off the wall here, they talk about message uh, server message block, uh, which is a way a windows operation generally when you map a, a drive or a device uh, like the printer for example uh, you're using smb the server message block smb is a client server request response file sharing protocol on windows servers can make their own resources available to clients on the network three functions of smb messages uh, start authenticate and terminate messages uh, there's a control file and a and a control file and printer access. It can, I'm sorry, it can control file and printer access. It allows an application to send and receive messages to or from another device. Uh, unlike the file sharing supported by FTP, clients establish a long-term connection to servers. After the connection is established, the server of the client can access the resources on the server as though the resource is located on the client host. So when I'm on campus, on my college campus, um, I and I open up my access to uh, the, um, the intranet uh, for the college, um, I can see mapped um, uh, folders for shared department files. When I'm at home, I can't. Uh, they, it's not allowed uh, for us to share those files. Uh, but when I'm on the campus, that Windows environment uses SMB uh, to connect a folder. And it looks just like you would see a C drive or a D drive or folders you put on the C drive, multiple folders. It looks just like that. It's just the M drive and the M drive is mapped I guess that's how they came up with M drive mapped to the share folder. I don't know why they didn't call it S, but it doesn't matter. Uh, they the M drive is the mapped to the shared folder, and I can download files. Uh, and it, it's always there, just like a printer. Once it's connected, uh, it's um, uh, that's always there to be able to print to. Uh, and so um, that may use SMB as well, or it does use SMB. All right, that is our module 15. Hopefully that was informative, informative to you. Uh, I, I find this module relatively easy because it is information that you should already know. Maybe not every one of those application protocols, but many of them. I also want to just add briefly that not every application o uses the OSI model. So an easy example for that is Paint. Uh, Paint is an application, but it is not. It does isn't an application when it comes to the OSI model because it doesn't use the internet. There's no handshaking. There's no reaching out. There's nothing. Paint is just an on one computer application that you use on that device. Now there may be a, uh, an application. Let's just and I don't know this for sure, but let's say. Paint 3D allows multiple people to pr to paint in the same or modify a document in the same uh, in the same file at the same time. Well, then that would be an application uh, layer uh, application uh, that would be on the application layer. So you got to understand uh, only the concept that application layer protocols are those protocols that connect through the internet and those are the applications that you use. And then we learned earlier, uh, they can use either TCP or UDP depending on uh, a lot of things that we talked about in the last video. Go watch the last video. If you didn't watch it yet, it'll teach you everything you need to know about TCP and UDP. All right, great. Uh, my name uh, is Don LaFont, Professor Don. Uh, it has been a pleasure teaching you today. If you have any questions and you're here with me live, just hang on a second, and I'll uh, give you an opportunity to answer, ask those questions. I'll provide the best answers I can. If you are watching this as a recording inside of the NetAcad classroom, ask your questions inside the help discussion forums, and your fellow students and I will help you. If you're watching this as a recording on YouTube, please ask your questions in the comments area on, below this video and I'll do my best to occasionally swing by, but please feel free to answer each other's questions. Let's make this a community. 
Also rate and respond, rate and subscribe to my uh, my presentations, and you'll always uh, receive uh, notifications when uh, I make new videos. You'll be able to find those videos, and you'll help me out. I do appreciate uh, you um, that that thumbs up. And if there's anything I can improve, by all means, let me know that. Uh, I always love learning, uh, just like you guys. I uh, love learning and love learning how to do things better, and you guys can help me out. All right, that's it. Have a great week learning about Cisco, and I will see you in the next module. Thank you for coming to class.